Good morning, everyone. Um, first and foremost, you know, welcome to the Grand Rounds. Uh, thank you for the exhibitors, Bayer Corporation and Boringer for the sponsors. And for this morning, um, you know, it's my pleasure to introduce my very good friend, uh, Dr. Sanjum Sethi, who's a previous colleague of mine in Colombia. He's a great interventional cardiologist who not only specialize in the advanced coronary, the CTOs and endovascular interventions, he's actually the director as well for the PERT program, which is the pulmonary embolism response team in Columbia University, Irving Medical Center. A little background to uh, Sanjum, he received his medical degree from Chicago um, and completed his residency in Mount Sinai, in New York. And then he stayed on and then completed his fellowship in UCLA Medical Center and then completed a vascular medicine and endovascular fellowship in Columbia. Um, and that's where I met him. And we worked together on so many uh, cases, uh, very interesting cases and projects. Uh, so he performs catheter-based uh, interventions in coronary artery, pulmonary artery, peripheral artery, all the venous vascular beds. He also is extensively does his work in research, um, you know, focusing on these therapies and work very closely with um, uh, societies, AHAs. And it's my pleasure today, he'll be speaking on the emerging role of catheter-based therapies in the management of venous thromboembolism. Uh, Sanjum, it's such a pleasure and thank you for taking the time. Uh, thank you so much, Nadira. Um, it's good to see you, uh, even if it's virtual and not, not in person. So hopefully that'll be a possibility uh, soon. Um, I thank you all for, for, uh, for having me and for inviting me. Um, really a, a pleasure to be speaking to you about something that um, I'm certainly passionate about and uh, um, would love to uh, keep this as open as possible through this format. Uh, and please feel free to ask questions. Um, I really like to uh, make it as interactive as, as possible given the limitations. So um, uh, thank you for that introduction. I will be speaking about catheter-based therapies uh, in venous thromboembolism. These are my disclosures. And the learning objectives are really to discuss the pathophysiology and treatment for acute PE, understand the indications and complications for advanced therapies, and then uh, some a little bit about uh, decision-making between different uh, treatment options. So as these treatment options are emerging, we definitely have to start making some decisions about when one therapy may benefit one person versus another. So as you're all likely aware, uh, PE does have an increasing incidence. I think there's a whole variety of reasons for this. It is the third most common cardiovascular disease after MI and stroke. And not only are we concerned about the short-term implications, which can include uh, significant morbidity and mortality, but also long-term impl implications, which may include pulmonary hypertension. About 5% or so will develop pulmonary hypertension at two to three years. And there's probably a, a, a number of patients who also develop something called a chronic thromboembolic disease as well, and we can talk a little bit about that also. So mortality rate for acute P remains uh, high. So this is data that's collated from many different studies going back about 20 years. And you can see that at three months in an unselected population, you have mortality rates approaching 20%. And obviously those patients who present with more severe disease, such as massive pulmonary embolism, can have treatment uh, mortality rates 50% uh, or higher. Now, some of that terminology has changed, but massive P really means those patients who are uh, at the highest risk who may be in either, either cardiogenic shock or hypertensive. Those patients who are at risk, the uh, mortality rates can be anywhere from 5 to, uh, to 25%. And we'll talk a little bit about how to risk stratify these patients. So when, you, when we do think about risk stratification, I'm not going to go too much in depth in this because I really want to do focus on cases and focus on the role of of uh, catheter therapies. Uh, but we do th when we think about a PE patient, we're thinking about clinical markers, such as are they in shock? Would, do they have hypotension? Did they have syncope? So did they have transient hypotension? We think about markers of RV dysfunction. So did they, do they have RV dilation on echo? Do they have RV dilation on uh, CT? Uh, do they have elevated BNP or pro-BNP? Uh, and if they are in, undergoing an invasive therapy, are their right heart pressures elevated? So these are all markers of RV dysfunction. And as um, you're all likely aware, in the short term, pulmonary embolism is a right heart disease. So the short term uh, mortality and morbidity, the hypotension comes from right heart failure. Uh, and, and I think that's why as a cardiologist, I'm particularly interested 
in this disease process. We also think about markers of myocardial injury, such as cardiac troponin. So those patients who have um, multiple factors that are in this um, in this rubric that are elevated will then uh, present with higher risk uh, PE. So uh, to th talk a little bit about um, uh, RV to LV ratio, because that is important when we think about studies, and it's also important when we think about risk stratification. This is the first piece of information that you generally get. So if a patient comes in, you'll have their uh, vital signs and um, their clinical status. But in terms of imaging data, uh, patients get a CTA often before they can get an echo. And then on there, you can get a glimpse or a snapshot of what the right ventricle looks like. So normally the right ventricle um, is smaller than the left ventricle, as you're all aware. And in, uh, in pulmonary embolism, or at least a, a severe acute pulmonary embolism, the RV would be naturally enlarged. Uh, and so uh, a RV to LV ratio greater than 0.9 has been significantly associated with worsening prognosis and the fact that uh, there is a significant uh, um, RV dysfunction uh, as well as potentially a significant PE in that situation. And this is a axial view and that's how you measure it. So you can obviously measure the same thing on echocardiography and as well as echocardiography is more sensitive and giving you much more or much more detailed uh, uh, ways to evaluate the RV function. So you can look at, um, not only can you look at for RV dilation, you can look at for uh, uh, flattened intraventricular septum, you can look for IVC distension, uh, you can look for uh, TAPSI or M mode or other um, tissue Doppler, other signs of RV function. All of those can help to risk stratify these particular patients. And in my clinical practice, uh, the status of the RV plays a large role into where I think this patient is in terms of having a hemodynamically significant um, PE. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is so important. Um, an RV to LV ratio greater than 0.9 has been shown to be an independent predictor of hospital mortality. Uh, and that if it's less than 0.9, uh, you can see the mortality rate in this registry is 1.9%, greater than 0.9 was 6.6%. So it really does matter in terms of uh, your risk stratification paradigm. So when we think about um, pulmonary embolism, this is data from uh, 1999. So this is the ICOP registry, which is about 2,500 patients. This is the seminal uh, work that was done at that time. This was published in 1999. Massive, which is 5% of PE patients had a 58% 90-day mortality. So this was defined as patients who had greater than 15 minutes of a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 millimeters mercury. Submassive, which is now called intermediate risk, with a 22% 90-day mortality. So these would be patients who did not have hypotension, but did have uh, signs of right heart strain, such as what we had alluded to earlier. And then minor, which would be the majority of patients had a 15% 90-day mortality rate. These are patients who had chest pain, mild tachycardia, maybe some hemoptysis, maybe some pulmonary infarction, pleuritic chest pain, et cetera. Now, you could argue that, well, it's been 20 years, we should be doing better now than we were doing then. And the reality is that uh, we really aren't. So this is data from the Massachusetts General Hospital. And you can see that at 90 days, uh, for, for patients with massive PE, mortality rate was 41%. And for submassive PE, mortality rate was 12%. This is about uh, 350 patients that they had, give or take. So you can see that even though, despite there being a lot of time since these two studies, uh, there hasn't been a dramatic improvement, maybe some mild improvement, um, in the in the mortality rate for PE. And uh, the argument is, is that are there things that we can do uh, and mechanical ways that we can now uh, address uh, this disease process to help reduce um, this, uh, this burden? So this is the new guidelines from the ESC. Uh, they've removed massive, submassive, and low, and really have changed it to high, intermediate, and low. And in your intermediate, they've changed it to intermediate high and intermediate low. And the reason for that is it helps to risk stratify the patients to which patients may be best for um, needing an advanced therapy. So those patients who are in the high group, those who are hemodynamically unstable, who have RV dysfunction, elevated troponin levels, those patients need emergent therapy. So this would be the STEMI analog or STEMI equivalent uh, of a, in terms of PE. These patients are uh, in cardiogenic shock, they need rapid stabilization. Um, and then you can decide on what treatment options uh, 
would maybe be beneficial to those patients. I'm gonna give some case examples of each of these to sort of highlight some of the options we have for each of these. Those who are low risk generally don't need a catheter-based or other advanced therapy. Those patients can often be rapidly discharged. They can be managed in uh, an outpatient setting many times, or at least with minimal hospital stays. And for them, it's really outpatient follow-up, good anticoagulation, then assessing um, you know, why this happened and how to prevent it. Um, the the decision-making really all happens in that intermediate zone. Intermediate high is those who may be hemodynamically stable, but those who have some degree of RV dysfunction, um, as well as uh, clinical signs and cardiac troponin, intermediate low may have um, one or none of those factors. And that may help to discriminate those people who may best benefit from something more uh, advanced. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So the reason this actually matters now is because before you could risk stratify patients, but all you were going to do anyways, for the most part, aside from uh, Alteplase, was you were, you were going to give heparin and you're going to cross your fingers and then see how the patient did. The reality is with all of these new options that we have now, we, have, uh, we don't have to rely on this paradigm anymore. And we can start thinking about what we can do for different patients, whether it be surgical, medical, or catheter-based. So I'm going to do this uh, in a case-wise fashion because I think it helps illustrate uh, some of the points that we're going to get to. So this is a patient who's 53, morbidly obese, uh, provoked DVT in the 90s, and then had uh, three to four years of Coumadin. Uh, he um, was a teacher and was uh, interested in uh, moving out of New York, moving to North Carolina to retire. This is right before the pandemic. And um, he'd done three to four weeks of multiple car trips. Um, and because he didn't have much time off, he would sort of do it all in one go and he would use cocaine to stay awake. So he was doing these multiple trips really with, with minimal break. Um, and he developed progressive dyspnea, two to three days of severe exertional dyspnea at half a block. Um, and then had an episode of syncope while working with physical therapy. He had some knee pain that he was working with them for. In the ER, his systolic blood pressure was in the 70s, heart rate 122. And his saturation was in 92%, which then he quickly decompensated to BiPAP. You know, RV heave, accessory muscle use, um, and one plus edema. Um, his troponin was elevated. NT pro BNP was elevated. Lactate um, was elevated. Um, and he had no family history of VTE. Here's his echocardiogram. You can see D-shaped septum in the uh, short axis view. Obese gentleman, so not the greatest apical four, but you can tell really underfilled LV, um, large dilated RV that isn't really moving well at all. This was our decision-making at that time. Um, I, I've excluded catheter-directed thrombectomy, um, but that was also in the, in the consideration. And the guidelines would probably suggest this patient be sustained undergo systemic thrombolysis, and I'll discuss a little bit about why we didn't do that. Um, we actually uh, chose to stabilize this patient's hemodynamics using ECMO, um, and um, the the field has sort of moved a little bit quicker than the way that uh, the, um, the guidance has moved. So the guidelines really do suggest that at this point, thrombolysis is still the first-line treatment but a lot of what we see in terms of PE is disease that is anywhere on the spectrum from acute to chronic. Often you don't know how long patients have been developing thrombus either in their leg or how long they've developed it um, in, their, in their lungs. And many times the patients present with an acute on chronic situation where they've had multiple recurrent hits that they've tolerated and now um, are presenting with a hit that is uh, pushing them over the edge and pushing that RV past. Um, compensation into failure. And so uh, in our practice, if if feasible for the patient and, and feasible in terms of getting them into our system, we do choose to actually stabilize these patients on ECMO first now prior to thrombolysis, because that gives us time once we've offloaded that RV and stabilized the patient to choose what is the best therapy for the patient. Sometimes that might be catheter-based, that may be surgical, or that may be heparin alone. We don't necessarily need to give them thrombolysis anymore if we can stabilize those patients up front with ECMO. Now, if you're in a situation where you don't have ECMO availability, then thrombolysis certainly would be um, a viable option for these patients. I'm gonna talk about in this one why thrombolysis probably would not have even been effective. Um, this is a uh, small retrospective analysis from the Massachusetts General Hospital. This, they looked at their uh, pre-ECMO era versus their post-ECMO era. And what they found is that in the pre-ECMO era, they had much more use of intravenous thrombolysis um, 
and, and much less use of catheter-directed therapy. It flipped in the post-ECMO era, um, and there was maybe a hint um, for better survival in the post-ECMO era, but obviously this is retrospective, small center, uh, small single center bias data. Um, similarly, this is from the National Inpatient Sample. This was published out of uh, the Cleveland Clinic, and they looked at 77,000 hospitalizations for PE. What they found was that there was lower in-hospital mortality with ECMO use um, versus not. So there is now some hints that uh, ECMO use in this highest risk group uh, may be of benefit. And now this is going to be a very difficult patient population to st study in a randomized fashion, but this is some suggestion that stabilizing these patients may be the best course of action. There's an analog uh, in the uh, coronary artery space when people are now looking at um, hemodynamic stabilization for cardiogenic shock. Um, these patients are coming in with cardiogenic shock, and I think stabilizing them does make a lot of sense. In, pretty, in this particular case, once we stabilize the patient, we, he underwent a pulmonary angiogram. You can see here on the right panel, he has got basically complete obliteration uh, of the uh, flow to the right pulmonary artery. And on the left side, there is uh, significant thrombus. I hope you can see my pointer. There's significant thrombus into the left uh, lower lobe. So really um, significant uh, uh, decrease in the blood flow to both uh, pulmonary uh, artery trees. Now, on the right side, you can see this sort of cast-like formation of the thrombus. Now, for those people who do this on a regular basis, um, this organization does not happen overnight. So this suggests a more chronic um, process when you see sort of these well-defined borders and more cast-like uh, appearance on the pulmonary angiogram, especially the degree of bulky thrombus that exists there. There's unlikely a catheter-based approach uh, would be successful in this particular situation. And there are some hints from the history about why this patient may be more of an acute uh, on chronic uh, situation. One is that he had multiple um, uh, uh, car rides um, and would suggest that his dyspnea was more progressive over several weeks. And the fact that he had had a prior VTE in the past all do suggest to some degree that there may be a chronic component um, to his um, disease. Now, normally we do these angiograms under uh, digital subtraction his breathing was unfortunately not able to cooperate with us. Some more hints here on the right heart cath. So his uh, RV was, uh, PA was 67 over 33 with a mean of 43. And his cardiac output, cardiac index was 1.8, even on ECMO support. Now that pulmonary artery, um, again, suggests more of a chronic picture. Generally, a untrained RV will not give you a PA pressure above 60 or even 70. Um, so when you see PA pressures are 70, 80, 90 or higher, you know that there's some chronic uh, component or some chronic training of the right ventricle. In this case, given all of those factors, we chose to um, have this patient undergo a surgical intervention, intervention, but this is the surgical specimen that was taken out. So as we had clinically suspected, um, the whitish is all chronic and the reddish there is more of the acute. Um, the right lung is at the top and the left lung is at the bottom. But you can understand there that um, thrombolysis may have provided some benefit, but would not have taken care of the majority of this patient's problem. Um, and so really surgical intervention was the best uh, choice for this. Now this is surgical thromboendarterectomy. This is not surgical embolectomy. Surgical embolectomy would just uh, be removing fresh thrombus. Surgical thromboendarterectomy requires um, uh, going through tissue planes and removing some of these more chronic things. I'm not a surgeon, but that um, is uh, a different, it's a different kind of an operation. The patient discharged and uh, doing well in follow-up. Uh, he's done, he's moved to North Carolina and has lost follow-up with us since then. Um, so talking a little bit more about uh, thrombolysis um, versus um, anticoagulation alone. So um, the da data behind thrombolysis is actually fairly meager. There was a randomized trial done in the mid nineties where they randomized eight patients um, with massive PE, average systolic blood pressure in the 70s. All four patients in the anticoagulation group died. All four patients in the thrombolysis group survived, and they stopped the study. So th that's very meager data to be basing um, uh, our, our entire um, guidance on, and which is why I also think that the um, paradigm is going to shift over time. Uh, surgical embolectomy. Um, uh, while this was not that, um, does still is still useful for patients with acute PE with right heart 
uh, right atrial thrombus, or especially those who may have a paradoxical embolism with a clot traversing a PFO, does require some expertise. In older series, there is mortality that is high, um, but definitely lower uh, in the modern era. Uh, this is the, the, the guidelines from the European Heart Journal. I'm referencing the European guidelines because the American guidelines have not been updated for several years, and the European guidelines were updated uh, in 2020, and really the more, more uh, modern guidance when it comes to this. Uh, does suggest um, antivirus to unfractionate heparin, systemic thrombolytic therapy for high-risk P and surgical embolectomy if you cannot get that. However, as you can see now, um, ECMO is now a 2B indication, percutaneous catheter-based treatment is now a 2A indication. So this is moving on up uh, in terms of what we think is the um, appropriate treatment for these patients. Uh, in terms of the future, there is an ongoing study for um, uh, Massive PE patients called FLAME. This is uh, public. This is uh, sponsored by one of the industry uh, uh, groups called uh, Industry Catheter Therapy. It's called Anari, um, and um, they're looking at about seventy-five patients, and they're going to be um, looking in a non-randomized fashion at both ECMO uh, versus non-ECMO uh, catheter-based therapy, uh, catheter-based uh, thrombectomy, I should say, uh, for um, patients with uh, massive PE. Uh, and in our center, like I said we move towards more rapid catheter-based therapy with or without ECMO for these patients. This is another patient, um, uh, uh, 35, had an IVC filter placed prophylactically before bariatric surgery, no known history of VTE, ankle fracture two months prior, left leg swelling and syncope, heart rate's 130, BP's okay, respiratory rate's 24, starting 93% on room air, um, and two plus lower extremity edema. Uh, on, uh, I will show you the CTA where there's multiple PEs, NT Pro B and P and troponin are both elevated. Um, and you can see here in the right uh, dis, um, uh, left lower, sorry, in the right distal main pulmonary artery on the right side, in the left lower pulmonary artery on the left side. And you can see here that the RV to LV ratio is certainly um, uh, elevated. I would give it eyeball 1.2 or so. Lower extremity ultrasound, he has a, a complete occlusion uh, of the left femoral vein. Uh, again, uh, we thought about uh, uh, our decision making at this point. Um, and to talk a little bit about uh, the RV. So, we talked uh, again about uh, what the RV means and how those patients who are um, in, in hemodynamically unstable, we already talked about really do need urgent treatment. But what about a patient like this? Tachycardic, young, but blood pressure is preserved. He's satting a little bit low. And he's a little bit tachypnic. Would that patient benefit from um, a intervention? So prognostically, we know that his prognosis um, is not as good as somebody who has a low-risk PE. Those patients with elevated troponin, RV dysfunction, have a higher risk uh, of adverse outcomes. And the RV in particular has shown to be an independent predictor of mortality. There's a stepwise increase as the RV to LV ratio increases, particularly above 1.5, uh, seems to be a significant cutoff. Um, they have a higher chance of adverse events within 30 days. And those whose RV dilation does not resolve are more eight times more likely to ever occur in VTE. So certainly the RV matters, not just short-term, but potentially long-term. And the reason for that is that um, RV is acts more like a dam relative to the LV. In, in other words, as the RV dilates, it's like a balloon, right? So it, it dilates, 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 and then um, there is prompt failure. And the reason for that is that as the RV dilates, you have increased um, RV oxygen demand, RV ischemia, RV contractility goes down, RV output goes down, and now um, you're in that spiral of cryogenic shock leading to death. Because now you, uh, you have low cardiac output, low LV preload, systemic blood pressure drops, RV oxygen, and now it, it now your oxygen delivery drops back uh, to the preload side. Uh, and so now you have a, a complete uh, collapse of the cardiovascular um, system. But the RV has a significant capacity to dilate, but remember, it's not a pressure chamber. So there's going to be an area where um, at a certain point, the RV fails. And the way it fails is, um, it, because it fails sort of all of a sudden, um, it is important to try to get to these patients before the RV is in complete failure and they're in that massive category. And some of that lesson we actually know from 
about a decade ago when the PITHO study was done. So the PITHO study looked at about 1,000 patients, 500 were going to get tenecteplase for, this is now for hemodynamically stable, high-risk PE that those have RV strain versus placebo. So there's no mortality difference in this group. However, there was less treatment escalation, less hemodynamic collapse within seven days, less CPR, less hypotension, less catecholamines in the in the play, in the group that got tenecteplase, which suggests that if you can identify those patients that are at the highest risk, you may be able to modify outcomes. Um, the problem with using tenecteplase is that there was an, uh, a bleeding hazard that was too high. So major bleeding was 10 times higher. Hem hemorrhagic stroke was 10 times higher. Uh, and so you had too high of a bleeding risk for the potential benefit. When you looked at it in a meta-analysis, there was actually a reduction um, in mortality. So this is using all the studies, including PITHO, although that was certainly the dominant study, uh, suggested that there was a reduction in mortality using tenecteplase, um, but a threefold increase in major bleeding. So this data is what really spurred the field of catheter-based therapy, because what we learned was that in high and intermediate high-risk PE, systemic thrombolysis may reduce mortality and recurrent PE, but the risk of major bleeding and intracranial bleeding was too high. So can you get your cake and eat it too? Can you be able to deliver therapy that is going to be just as effective in reducing um, uh, hemodynamic decrease, reducing, uh, uh, um, reducing mortality even potentially um, without that bleeding hazard? So that's burned thrombectomy devices. They're not aspiration thrombectomy, thrombus fragmentation, rheolytic thrombectomy, hybrid therapy, um, and these are some of the th and thrombo and local thrombolysis. So these are some of the therapies that are on the market right now. The ECOS catheter is a uh, uh, fibrinolysis catheter. Um, it de it uh, delivers uh, TPA as well as ultrasound to help uh, break up fibrin. Uh, I have a pigtail catheter on there. That was the old way to deliver thrombolysis and also macerate some of the thrombus. Um, you can also use uh, what's called a Krang McNamara catheter, which is just um, a catheter that has multiple side ports to infuse TPA. On the thrombectomy side, uh, the Inari Trever catheter has been on the market for now uh, probably about four years, five years. The Penumbra catheter um, is on the market as well, it comes in different sizes. We can talk a little bit about that. Um, and the Angiovac catheter is used for intracardiac masses, um, although there is probably a dozen or so catheters in development, um, all to iterate on some of the lessons that we've learned for catheter-based therapy. So standard catheter thrombolysis is how it works. You put a catheter through the clot and then you, with multiple side ports, you infuse a TPA. The idea is that by infusing um, alteplase, tenecteplase, or, or any uh, TPA kind of drug, directly into the thrombus, you can give a lot less of the dose, thereby reducing your bleeding risk. And so this was a first attempt to reduce that bleeding risk, but also get some of the benefit in the higher risk patients. The ultrasound assisted thrombolysis, which is ECOS, this is FDA approved and has been studied, may reduce the dripping time at TPA dose, TPA dose by using ultrasound to help break up those uh, fibrin crosslinks. This was studied in the Seattle 2 study. This was a 150 person registry. These patients had symptoms less than 14 days, massive or submassive RV to LV ratio greater than 0.9. There was a 25% decrease in the RV to LV ratio at 48 hours uh, and decrease in pulmonary artery systolic pressure and angiographic obstruction on CT without intracranial hemorrhage. Um, now, this is a 150 patient registry. Um, the outcomes are a surrogate endpoint, and we need to keep all of that in mind. When you look at the randomized data for this, which is the earned, or only current published randomized data, which is 30 patients, they found that ECOS plus heparin um, did not reduce the RV to LV ratio. Um, I'm sorry, ECOS plus heparin significantly reduced the RV to LV ratio at 24 hours um, versus, versus heparin alone. However, at 90 days, uh, they were the same. So this suggested that there's certainly short-term benefit um, to getting thrombolysis, but long-term, maybe the patients end up uh, in the same place. So going back to our patient, 
Um, we can think about different options for this patient. Um, certainly given the tachycardia, RV strain, uh, and um, uh, significant um, uh, clinical signs, we think that there may be some at least short-term benefit uh, and given his age uh, to pursuing a catheter-based approach. We did, it, we did a right heart cath, PA pressure was 42 over 19, mean of 28, cardiac index was 2.6. So what's interesting is that there are a percentage of these patients who do have a cardiac index less than two, even though their blood pressure is preserved, but this patient clearly, uh, the RV was still compensating to some degree. We did a pulmonary angiogram, uh, and you can see here under DSA, significant large bulky thrombus into the left with almost no flow uh, into that left lower lobe, really paucity of flow into the left lower lobe arteries. And then on the right side, similarly, um, really decrease of flow. We see significant decrease in the right lower lobe. So we discussed it with the patient and we decided that um, pursuing um, catheter-based uh, therapy with ECOS would be the best option. It felt like it would be bulky for catheter thrombectomy. Uh, and you can see here, these little dots are the areas where um, the TPA would be, um, uh, would, would, um, would uh, go into the thrombus. This was his, we didn't have a pre-echo, but this was his post-echo. You can see that the RV has recovered um, quite nicely. So um, a couple of points here. So one is that um, trends to the future, device development will continue to accelerate um, and we're gonna continue to have 100% registry studies until we generate higher quality evidence. So this is a little bit incumbent upon us. They, because the FDA approved ECOS with that data, that became the standard. So now every device that is coming out is a 100 to 150 person registry study looking at RV to LV ratio. And so we really do need to focus and pursue higher quality evidence. Now, there is promise in this sense. There are now three randomized controlled trials, either in develop four, I should say, either in development or um, ongoing. So uh, Inari has the uh, um, uh, FLASH study. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I believe it's, I'm blanking on the name, but it's a, it's a um, peerless study. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a peerless study, which is looking at um, about 500 patients randomized to thrombectomy versus uh, thrombolysis. So that is studying different strategies, both catheter-based. The um, One of the uh, highest quality studies, which is a combination between Boston Scientific and the PERT Consortium, is high pytho, which is, again, around 500 patients looking at ECOS plus anticoagulation versus anticoagulation alone. I think this is going to be the seminal study that is going to help us understand uh, the role of catheter-based thrombolysis for the highest risk um, cohort. Uh, and then uh, the other industry partners, um, uh, Penumbra has a study that's called, uh, uh, blanking on the name there as well, but it's looking at catheter-based thrombectomy versus thrombolysis. Uh, and then the NIH is studying a study called P-TRAC, which is also going to be thrombolysis versus anticoagulation. So the data is coming, uh, but we do need to push both industry, societies, um, and the government to help fund really high quality data that's gonna help us inform uh, treatment decisions for these patients. So we think about risk stratification, we think about um, those patients who are massive or high risk, the goals are hemodynamic stabilization, eliminate obstruction, RV recovery. Those patients are submassive, uh, um, the goals there are prevent decompensation, promote RV to recovery, and then those patients who are low risk, we really want to prevent recurrent PE. Now, something that is out there that people are like, well, if you do uh, catheter-based therapy, you're going to prevent long-term outcomes. We don't know that yet. So there are a certain, about 5% of patients develop chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. About 5 to 10% of patients develop chronic thromboembolic disease. But we don't know if either of those um, is prevented by doing a catheter-based therapy up front. We do think that that is uh, plausible, uh, but we do need more data to actually prove that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about catheter-based thrombectomy. This is a 78-year-old woman, two prior strokes and tobacco abuse, but otherwise independent with her ADLs, found down at home and obtunded. Um, recent fall two weeks ago with head trauma, unclear the circumstances of that fall, goes to an outside hospital with systolic blood pressure in the 70s, 
O2 sat less than 80% of room air. Patients rapidly intubated and started on multiple pressors. In general, those patients with massive P, you want to try not to intubate them um, because uh, they will they will generally uh, uh, crash or code because um, of the effects of um, decreasing that um, preload onto the RV. Um, that's why, again, another reason we we try to promote hemodynamic stabilization. That case I presented earlier, that patient was actually not intubated. So that patient was due on a wake ECMO. Um, Start on multiple pressors, this patient, um, heart rate in the hundreds when they uh, uh, came, blood pressure okay, um, but on pressors and then on max on the vent, patient has left eyelid ecchymosis, uh, large, long history of tobacco abuse, lives at home but independent with her ADLs, uh, and then two brothers had passed away from lung cancer, uh, B and P and troponin are elevated, creatinine's okay. Um, I don't have the, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show you the outside hospital chest CT in a second. Patients on uh, norepinephrine and vasopressin at, at large doses and TT is performed on arrival. Here is the RV to LV on the outside hospital CT. You can see um, that the ratio is, is significant, um, 1.5 or greater. Certainly in the RV, it looks like it's small and underfilled. There is clot in the left lower lobe, um, but you can see here on the right side, there is a hyalur lung mass in addition um, to thrombus. And so the thought is that this patient had undiagnosed uh, lung cancer. Now you can see here again, um, there is significant, um, a large uh, hyalur lung mass on the right um, and the left lower lobe uh, thrombus. This is in the coronal view. Um, TT on arrival, there's severe RV enlargement with the connals and flattening of the interventricular septum. Um, you can see here, um, the RV really is not moving well. There's some apical hyperkinesis, uh, but otherwise um, significant RV dysfunction. Um, and then we had our, our PE discussion. So this patient clearly had massive PE, was concerned not a candidate for surgery or ECMO, uh, given the fact that the patient had likely um, significant, uh, uh, you know, either uh, stage three or stage four lung cancer that was undiagnosed. Um, and TPA was unfavorable, right? Given age, history of stroke, recent eyelid ecchymosis, large chest mass. Um, and so this was actually the first case that we did with thrombectomy, but the decision was to pr proceed with uh, catheter-based thrombectomy. Uh, we did a right heart cath, PA was 54 over 25, mean of 37, and a cardiogenics was 1.9, despite being on multiple pressors. Uh, we did a pigtail, um, and you can see here, there's large thrombus sort of draped uh, across um, the distal right main PA. This is actually a very favorable uh, place for thrombus to be. And you can see here, this is less dense, less cath-like than those other angiograms I showed you. And this would give you, this would be more favorable for catheter-based uh, intervention. On the left side, uh, again, you can see here, there's thrombus, just like the CT really extending down uh, into the left lower lobe um, with significant um, distal, uh, both lower and upper um, decrease in blood flow. Really what should be normal is what you see in that uh, middle segment there. Um, there's no left middle uh, low, but um, in the left sort of the lingula segment here, that would be more normal. But whenever you see paucity um, and decreased blush distally, that suggests that there's uh, obstruction causing decrease in flow. Um, this is the catheter that we use. This is the old uh, first generation device. It has since been uh, iterated. It now comes in tw uh, uh, tw uh, 24 French, 16 French, and 12, uh, 20 French. Um, put an Amplast stiff wire uh, deep into the uh, pulmonary artery. Uh, then you take the catheter up and over. Similar to what you may use in the coronary, you use uh, really suction thrombectomy. There is a mechanical component, but the suction thrombectomy is what is most uh, used. Um, and you can see here post-procedure, we did get some improvement, although maybe not complete. Uh, extraction of the thrombus in the right lung. You see definitely in the right lower, there's improved blush really extending all the way out to the periphery. Um, on the left side, uh, we had a little bit more success. You can see we took the catheter down uh, into that. Um, we retracted the catheter um, with the clot sort of on the edge of it. And you can see here really improved distal flow with minimal uh, thrombus remaining in that left lower lobe segment. This is what uh, we removed from the right uh, and the left lung. Uh, and you can see here that on the table, the PA pressure uh, decreased by nine, decreased by five in the mean. 
This can be variable as we've done these. Uh, sometimes the PA pressure may actually go up if the RV is really under severe strain. Sometimes it may not change, um, but certainly we could um, see that the uh, um, prior to leaving the procedure room, the pressures were cut in half and off by the next day. FiO2 was down to 50% within 12 hours, uh, and the patient was discharged home. Um, now, prior to doing this, uh, we had thought about going a palliative route, but the family really wasn't ready for that. Um, and so we did feel like it would be worth to at least the patient to be able to get their work up, be able to say proper um, uh, goodbye, or at least do a proper family planning if this uh, mass was not uh, able to be taken care of. But this patient is still being followed in pulmonary clinic um, and being treated for their cancer. Um, and this was their echo post uh, procedure. So you can see here really a complete resolution and normalization uh, of that RV. Uh, similarly, the data behind this is still um, uh, coming out. So this was a FLARE study, which is 106 patients, showed a decrease, significant decrease in the RV to LV ratio at 48 hours um, with minimal uh, 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 or minimal complications and good, um, uh, good uh, uh, success, technical success. Now, a lot of people, and now there's further registry, it's called the FLASH registry, which also suggests that even in 800 patients, there is um, uh, pretty good rates of, of technical success, minimal complications, um, and good decrease in the RV to LV ratio. Well, that's, this is why we need better data is that 48 hour RV to LV ratio is not what's clinically meaningful. Um, and so we really do need good clinical meaningful outcomes. So a lot of people do ask me, okay, well, what about thrombectomy uh, versus thrombolysis? How do you choose? Uh, I think this is an ongoing debate. It's a, sort of a battle of the heavyweights here. Um, and there is no, no current guidance. Uh, so in our practice, some factors that fa favor uh, catheter-directed thrombolysis, the thrombus is distal. So these catheters that are, the thrombectomy catheters uh, may not reach, um, or you may have to push your wire out far where you can risk a wire injury. And the thought is that if the thrombus is distal, the TPA will sort of seep down. Um, and there is some evidence um, that microvascular uh, obstruction is better relieved uh, with catheter-directed thrombo thrombolysis. Similarly, those are, who are hypoxia predominant are generally fall into two categories. So generally those patients who come in uh, with preserved hemodynamics, but um, severely decreased oxygen either have a parenchymal lung disease or um, they are generally the, the, the lesser phenotype or, or the less common phenotype, rather they have severe distal um, obstruction. So, so again, that microvascular may be useful, or they may have a PFO causing significant shunting, which again, if a patient has a PFO, you may not want to be dragging a catheter across them. Uh, and those patients who do not have trauma or surgery uh, would obviously um, be more favorable. In other words, those who do have trauma or surgery, you may want to move towards thrombectomy. Um, patients with throm catheter thrombolysis do tend to bleed wherever the trauma or surgery is. Uh, and then logistics of your lab. So um, there is some thought that uh, um, the thrombectomy may be preferred because it may decrease your ICU stay, but you may be in a situation where the procedural space is more valuable and the catheter thrombolysis is a faster procedure in the lab. So if you have multiple lab goings, you don't have time to do a, a thrombectomy procedure, maybe thrombolysis may be more favorable. Uh, factors favoring thrombectomy, you certainly do get more rapid thrombus removal, especially proximally. And so those who are hemodynamic predominant coming on hypotension, you want to relieve that outflow obstruction on the RV rapidly. And so thrombectomy may be more favorable. Those are bleeding contraindication. So you just need to do this with heparin. Um, you don't, uh, so you still cannot have um, absolute bleeding on contraindication. But those who may just have low platelets or may have um, some other reason where you may not want to do TPA, recent trauma, recent surgery, thrombectomy would be better. And again, logistics, maybe you don't have that ICU space for catheter thrombolysis. You may be able to treat the patient with thrombectomy and um, not have them go to the ICU. Now, most of our patients do go to the ICU if they're not that sick, um, but certainly a consideration. Uh, and thrombectomy devices are going to continue to iterate. I think one of the biggest challenges is how to handle more organized subacute or chronic thrombus, um, and there are ongoing catheters being developed for this purpose. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going uh, to skip this other case um, and just go to a little bit about 
PE and per, uh, per teams, but uh, this was an, a nice case of uh, thrombus removal and then, and then stenting um, because of uh, may Thurner syndrome. Um, so the uh, fundamental concept uh, that has sort of taken off the last decade is team-based approach. Now we see that in valve disease, we see that in chronic, uh, chronic and critical limb ischemia, uh, we see that uh, in diabetes, we see that really throughout in heart failure, we see that throughout uh, cardiovascular disease because we know that multidisciplinary teams can provide um, expertise across multiple disciplines that may help you take care of the patient. And uh, I think the, the challenge is how do you get all of those patients and people on board um, without having sort of a decision paralysis? And so I, I, I'm a strong believer that PERTs or pulmonary embolism response teams are a really good way to help deal with this disease process. Traditionally, pulmonary embolism has been really an orphan disease where uh, depending on the institution, different people may deal with it. So you, some places may be vascular medicine, vascular surgery, hematology, uh, pulmonary cardiology. And in some teams, it's in some places, it's it all of these that may work in a combination. So uh, we do know that um, less than 5% of patients will receive advanced therapy despite clear indications, and many more are eligible that, than that will receive. And some of that is decision-making paralysis, fear of complications. And you know sometimes the, the medicine person is the one who gets in the middle of this, right? Because they may be calling different services and the surgeon may say, I don't think uh, thrombectomy or surgical thrombectomy is good. And the interventional radiologist or interventional cardiologist may say, I don't think catheter base is appropriate. Um, and uh, they may be referring to each other. And so really having a team-based approach may help alleviate some of that. And the idea is that this should be model our rapid response concept to convene a multidisciplinary team of experts to come up with the best patient. So the previous paradigm was really chaos, right? So referring hospital, there's a severe PE and you basically got the therapy that the person who would call for um, would get. And we all certainly have biases in, in terms of what we would recommend to our particular patients. This is a much more streamlined approach to that, um, to that concept. And you, you really you do wanna have a multidisciplinary team uh, when it comes to this. We are a member of the PERT consortium uh, and we recommend uh, everybody joining because we're collating all of our data um, and really sharing best practices across different institutions. Um, and there is some hint, this is from a case in uh, Cleveland that for those patients who do have a PERT system or PERT consult, there is a reduction in morbidity and mortality. So for um, patients who got it, the, on the left is patients um, uh, who got PERT uh, in dark and the patients who did not get PERT uh, in the light. And these are the higher risk patients you can see uh, better mortality, same degree of bleeding, better readmissions, both at 30 and 90 days if, the, if there was a PERT team or the patient got a PERT console. Now, again, this is retrospective bias data, um, but certainly um, does signal that maybe there is a beneficial effect here. Um, I think uh, PERTs will continue to expand and consolidate, uh, but we do need data to support the benefit and not just uh, more procedures. So I'm gonna summarize by showing you the guideline slide again. So you can see that for the high-risk patients, we wanna think about um, urgent uh, intervention, whether that be medical, catheter, or surgical, plus or minus hemodynamic support. For that intermediate high group, we wanna consider a catheter or surgical-based treatment. And for intermediate low or low, um, you can usually get away with medical therapy in most. Um, some take-home points here. Pulmonary embolism, a heterogeneous disease with different clinical presentations. Multiple therapies exist if anticoagulation is not enough, but appropriate risk stratification is key and data is rapidly evolving. Uh, and PE teams may enhance care for patients with PE, other manifestations uh, of VT. I'm uh, happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Sanjum, for the great talk. Um, anybody who has questions?
Uh, good morning, and thank you for that uh, perspective on PE. I'm wondering if you, in your own experience, have ever um, intervened with either uh, thrombolysis or mechanical treatment in patients where the indication was just based on acute respiratory failure. And in particular, I'm thinking of COVID-19 patients who are severely hypoxemic and have a complicating pulmonary embolism where the hypoxemia is made worse, yet they're, quote, hemodynamically stable. I, I don't know if you've encountered that or not. Yeah, we we certainly have. Um, it, it becomes a little bit of a clinical um, understanding of what's causing the hypoxia. So if they have severe ARDS and the lung parenchyma are really the cause for it, our thought has been that doing something for the PE is unlikely to change the long-term outcome. So we're a little, con when it comes to COVID-19, we have intervened, um, but we're a little conservative. We intervene more when there is evidence of uh, some degree of uh, pressure requirement or some degree of hemodynamic compromise, and particularly in those patients. But there is a subset of patients that do present um, with severe hypoxemia and are hemodynamically okay. A lot of times, um, if we're on the fence there, and, and the CT can help us quite a bit because the CT can help to show is there significant lung parenchyma that is affected. So do they have a large pneumonia? Is there a large pleural effusion? And if the lung parenchyma looks fairly reasonable, um, then we can take them uh, for a procedure. Um, and then, you know, the first part of any procedure is really a right heart cath. And so that'll help us understand. So if they're humanly stable, but their cardiac index is 1.8, 1.9, we know that they're, even though their blood pressure is okay, um, that they're hemodynamically affected. Um, so we sort of take all of that into account. What does a lung parenchyma look like? What does the RV look like? Um, and so we're looking at um, uh, the lung parenchyma and particularly the RV in terms of RV strain and how dilated the RV is. Because what I, I do know is for in terms of catheter-based therapy, while I can't give you conclusive evidence that there is long-term benefit, I do know that the RV will get better faster. And getting the RV better faster seems to have improved outcome in certain subset of patients. So, so that's what I, I generally focus on. And if I really need a tiebreaker, the right heart cath when I'm in there um, can help me uh, uh, do a tiebreaker. Thank you for that, Dr. Sethi. Um, so we do have a question in the Q&A pod that comes from uh, Dr. John Lesser. He prefaces this by saying he may have missed it uh, in the presentation, but he asked, what about catheter-based salvage uh, for failed lysis? Yeah, I think um, that hasn't really been systematically studied in, in practice. Uh, I mean, there is some, um, there in some of the protocols for the different studies, I think we'll get more data on this. There is uh, a provision that if the patient you know, fails uh, one of the therapies that you proceed with another therapy. For the most part, um, I think the biggest challenge is that whether it's, systemic thrombolysis, catheter thrombolysis, or catheter thrombectomy, they all work really well on the acute thrombus. So when it's fibrin-rich acute thrombus, whether you use a suction catheter to suck it out, whether you use thrombolysis to sort of dissolve some of those fibrin crosslinks, all those things work really well. Um, and so depending upon what your clinical scenario is, you may have different outcomes. The problem is that none of it works really well when it becomes subacute or chronic. And so when we're talking about uh, uh, you know, that more collagen-based um, material. So the question is, why did they fail lysis? So if it's because it's chronic and that more collagen-based, it's unlikely that the catheter is also going to work in the current iterations of catheters. Now, I think there's promising technology that's going to come out, um, but generally, if they've failed, um, I'd be looking more towards a surgical approach than a catheter approach, uh, unless you're confident uh, of that you may be able to get some thrombus out and, and why. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions here in person? Yeah, Sanjum, so what in your clinical experience you've seen these patients, you've given us great examples where the RV function improved. What percentage do you see where the RV function did not improve upon discharge? And what is the follow-up of these patients in your practice? Yeah, so that's a really great question. I didn't you know, sort of include that. Um, in this because um, it's it's really, I, I think actually more work than even in the uh, acute side, we need um, to sort of formalize 
and develop P post PE clinics for these patients. So what I do in my practice is I see these patients at one month, three month, and six months. So at one month is really a, a system or, or a, a symptom check, make sure they're getting their anticoagulation, make sure they're on some sort of road to recovery, um, really enroll them in the clinic. At three months, we think about repeating that echo to see if there's RV resolution. And I'll say the vast majority of patients, whether they get a therapy or they don't, do have RV resolution. Now, obviously now, you know, we've restratified them up front. They're only seeing me because we've thought about an intervention. So even if I didn't intervene, I'm still seeing them. But again, I'm offering intervention to highest risk patients. So there is um, RV resolution in most patients. And then I'm going to repeat um, either a duplex to look at uh, uh, if they have lower extremity thrombus and or a VQ scan if they have ongoing symptoms. Because now I'm trying to restratify them. Are they developing CTEF or CTED? At six months, um, that's really when uh, the decision tree comes. Like, are they now really somebody who is um, going into sort of the post PE um, prevent recurrence situation? Because in the in the outpatient clinic, there's four major things that we're thinking about: finishing the treatment, because most patients are going to get at least six months of therapy with anticoagulation. Um, figuring out why this happened, if possible, uh, screening for long-term complications such as CTEF, and then preventing recurrence. And so we're trying to address all of those at each of those time points. But at six months, those who have ongoing symptoms, I then refer them to my colleague who deals with more chronic uh, thromboembolic uh, disease. Um, but that's sort of the cadence that we have. Uh, but, and, and then, you know, obviously it's modified and varied per, per patient. Are there any other questions? All right, Dr. Sethi, thank you very much for your time and have a great day, everyone. All right, thank you.